wondered about old buildings that are standing in your community and the stories they may tell? Or if you've had the opportunity to view old photographs possibly of your grandparents and the crazy clothes they wore? Or for that instance, why wasn't there any trees in those pictures, Chuck? Well, you know, Suzanne, I've wondered about that myself. I think one of the more fascinating aspects of being a human is the ability to wonder, why did that happen? And how did that happen? As Americans, we're always looking back in history, kind of as a trail to help us understand where we've been so we can understand where we're going. Hi, I'm Chuck Arning, park ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, and I'm with my colleagues and fellow, fellow rangers, Dick Cleaver and Suzanne Buchanan. And today, we're gonna to talk about preserving the historic Blackstone Valley, protecting what's old and meaningful. Matter of fact, Dick, talking about old and meaningful, this spot is a pretty good story to tell, doesn't it? All right, I'm old. I just hope I can be meaningful. <laughs> Matter of fact, we're standing here in front of the old Chestnut Hill Meeting House. This happens to be the oldest meeting house in Massachusetts, preserved in its original condition. There are some 20 that are older, but they've all been changed over the years. This is still exactly the way it was back in 1769. Not only that, but this is the third town this meeting house has been in. I don't mean it's been moved around. But times have changed. Originally, this was all Menden. Menden used to be called the Mother Menden because many communities were developed out of Menden. Then in what, 1845, it became Blackstone. And then finally, in 1916, it became Millville. When we talk about its final resting place, I hate to talk about that here in this beautiful cemetery, but well, you know what can happen. That's a really good story, Dick. But the question is, why do we want to preserve the valley, its history, its cultures, its wilderness areas like the Blackstone Gorge, its open spaces, the river, the canal? Well, we're not going to answer that question by telling you. Nope, we're going to show you. We're going to introduce you to some of the people who have gone out of their way to preserve various aspects of the history of the Blackstone Valley. Now, while it's true the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor and the National Park Service does provide some assistance to the groups, we can't do it by, by ourselves. It's up to all the people of the valley to get involved with the preserving of its great history. And that's what we're going to talk about and show you today. So grab your walking stick, because we're going on a walking tour of the Blackstone Valley. Now listen, how far a tour is this, Dick? Mr. Burl Dawson, our art teacher, helped us out on the drawings with pen and ink. 
and Mrs. Vanderdose also helped us with the creative writing. So you all come from the town of Slatersville? Yes. yes. So you have pride in your community. You have an interesting story to tell. And not only did you learn the story, but now you're telling that story. Yeah. Yep. yeah. What did you learn about the names of some of the streets? Well, Green Street was named because it has green shutters. It used to have all green shutters on there. Are there any there now? Um, yes. Yeah, so. yeah. Do you ever find yourself being a tour guide to your parents or to your aunt and uncle? Yes. Yeah, sometimes. 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 And that must make you feel good. Yeah. 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 Really good. It's nice to know more than one thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we wanted to give something back to the community. And that they surely have given back to the community, folks. And if you'd like to find out more about their walking tour, you can call our office or you can stop by here in Slatersville at the town hall or at the town library and obtain a walking brochure where you can come on out and enjoy Slatersville and see the creative work that the children have done. that were planned communities in New England at the early 1800s. And what do you think happens to old mills? Well, let's catch up with Ranger Jack Whitaker for our Blackstone moment, and I think we'll get answers to those questions. Hi, I'm Jack Whitaker, National Park Service Ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. In 1793, Shortly after Almy Brown and Slater first began to spin thread in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, they began something called Cotton Mania, which swept up the river through Rhode Island into Massachusetts. And only a stone's throw from where we're standing today, a fellow named Ebenezer Clapp in 1810 built a small mill here on Hartford Avenue in North Uxbridge, Massachusetts. He ran that mill until 1817 when a financier merchant from Boston named Robert Rogerson, came out and bought the site. Now, he bought the site, dam, pond, stream, the whole works. And here he built twin mills, the crown over my left shoulder and the eagle over my right shoulder, two separate mills built in 1823 and 1827. He named the mills the crown because of his English heritage and the eagle because of his adopted country. Robert Rogerson was a different type of financial wizard. He had cultural interests as well, and he was a longtime president of the very active and very well thought of Handel and Haydn Society of Boston, still in existence. When Rogerson built the mill, he did as many of the entrepreneurs in those days did, he built a village for his mill workers. In those days, they hired families, not individual workers. So a family of father, wife, and four, five, six children would be employed in the mill. And usually they were housed close by the mill. Here in Uxbridge, Rogerson, who was a classicist, uh, some knowledge of architecture, designed one of the more attractive mill villages anywhere in the Blackstone Valley or anywhere in the country. Rogerson Village is still occupied as housing. It's right across the uh, bridge of Hartford Avenue from the mill itself. Some people have uh, likened it to Jefferson's early structures at the University of Virginia. The red brick facades, the white trim, and the large mill building as the centerpiece. The Crown and Eagle fell into hard times as many of the contemporary mills did, and in 1837, it went under. Rogerson's creditors tried to run it as an operation called the Uxbridge Cotton Mills for a while, but then in 1850, the Whiten family bought the mill. The Whitens operated the mill until 1923. It was during the early part of the Whiten period that the red brick bridge crossing the Mumford River uh, connected the two wings of the mills into one solid building. At the height of their operation, the Whitens were employing close to 200 people here. After the death of Mr. Whiten, Mrs. Whiten, his widow, maintained the building as an empty uh, structure until her death well up into her 90s. Then, like so many other mills here in the valley, it began to fall into disrepair until a group of investors in the 1970s took it over and attempted to restructure it, to rebuild it, and to restore it. 
They were almost three quarters finished when in a monumental act of senseless vandalism, somebody torched the mill and it burned almost to the ground. But like the proverbial phoenix, the crown and eagle rose again. And it stands today as a housing for senior citizens here in Uxbridge and a monument to the dedication of private enterprise and local government to use the solid, stable, wonderful structures that line the Blackstone Valley. So here on this beautiful fall day here in North Uxbridge, this is Jack Whitaker saying this has been a Blackstone moment. See you again soon. a quiz for you. Where is a rare and unusual place that has a natural history and an industrial history, is a geologic abnormality, and has the distinction of being the oldest one of its kind? Well, do I have you stumped? Well, if I do, you might look over my shoulder and you might just find a clue there about where we are and what we're talking about. We're going to catch up with some people who are going to describe to us why this area is so important and why we should preserve it. We told you that we were going to give you a clue as to what is unique and rare about the village of Lime Rock. Well, we're here with Rick Greenwood, who's the project review coordinator for the Rhode Island Historic Preservation Commission. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history here. Now, as you can see, Rick, we're right by one of the famous lime kilns, aren't we? That's right. Uh, this is actually one of the later kilns. Behind us is uh, one of the probably 18th century kilns. This would appear to be a 19th century one, and you can tell by the uh, the iron uh, plate that's bolted around it that it was modified from the original pure stone construction to allow for a more efficient and uh, higher burning uh, temperature kiln in the late 19th century. And this is probably one of the kilns that was uh, one of the last to be operated here. Operations burning lime lasted until the 1920s, uh, nearly 250 years of operation on this site. Uh, probably one of the oldest industrial operations in uh, the Northeast. That's pretty incredible. Now, how do these uh, kilns work, and why, why did you burn lime? What was the point behind that? Right. Lime uh, is highly valued by masons, plasterers, and people such as that. In fact, you see behind us a fine example of why this lime was so good. It was a hard binding, made a hard binding mortar uh, that enabled stone masonry to survive very well. When the English colonists arrived here, they were used to having good quality lime from back home in England, uh, but at first could find none here. Uh, Massachusetts colony had absolutely no lime except what they got from burning oyster shells, a very time-consuming process, and not, not very good quality lime. So when the English colonists that came down to the Rhode Island area with Roger Williams encountered exposed ledges of natural lime, they were highly excited. And in fact, Williams wrote to the governor of Connecticut informing him that they had in fact finally found some good quality lime. And because it was prized and necessary for construction, masonry, uh, it was soon being processed and distributed throughout New England and eventually around the world. What you have in the ground is a hard rock lime. Basically, it is a mineral. And what you need to do to create it into the uh, the lime that can be pulverized and used by masons to create a mortar is to drive off various chemical compounds. And you do that with extreme heat. So basically you have a roasting process. The lime ore would, being, would be brought as well from the nearby quarries uh, that we'll see in a minute. And then they would be loaded in alternating layers within the kiln. And the fire would be started. Uh, the fire would have to be kept going from three to seven days, depending on the hardness of the lime. It had to be tended around the clock. And as the charcoal would burn down, it would have to be recharged from the base. And eventually, after, as I say, three to seven days, he would judge by the whiteness of the lime uh, that it had been roasted to the proper temperature. And then they would simply allow the fire to die down. They would pull out the core which is a process we don't know whole lots about, mm. but it probably is where a lot of the impurities would collect. So that would be pulled out, and then the uh, lime gradually allowed to cool off, and then it would be put in casks. Uh, once again, the local forests came into play there. Uh, chestnut wood 
the American chestnut, which was almost completely destroyed by the great blight in the early 20th century, was a very predominant wood uh, species around here. And it was just what they wanted for the wooden casks that they would pack the lime in and ship it to market. The, the nature of the process was that you're, you're driving off uh, chemical compounds so that when you reintroduce water to the lime, it will make a new chemical reaction that will fuse it into a hard binding mortar. So it's very important that those casks could be made uh, watertight and keep all moisture out so that the lime would be preserved. It's a pretty fascinating story. It's, it's very fascinating. Uh, and what's so amazing about it is that there was a, a large amount of expertise, organization, and business sense that went into it. And it all began in the late 17th century. Uh, a time we think of people out here just being simple farmers worried more about their cows and their beans than foreign markets, uh, transportation uh, across what were then very long distances from here to Providence, let us say, or up to Menden on the Great Road. Uh, and there were a, a, a tremendous interconnection of leases for wood, for digging lime, for burning uh, in the kilns. It really gives us a, a better sense of how sophisticated uh, the people in the 17th and 18th century were in terms of industry. We tend to think we invented those things or, right. or, or in the late 19th century. That's not the case. And uh, it also supported a wide range of other skills, such as the charcoal burners, uh, the coopers who would be busy working year round to have these casks ready to go. Uh, and then there were also the teamsters. There were four horse teams that would haul the lime uh, in the casks uh, to wherever they may go, originally down the Great Road to Providence. Uh, one of the developers of the lime industry, David Harris, in the mid-18th uh, century, had already purchased an interest in a wharf in Providence. So he was, in a sense, a merchant as well as a manufacturer. Uh, later on, when the Blackstone Canal was built, sort of over the ridge and down in the river valley, it could get hauled by canal uh, up to Worcester, where it was one of the major, major products that got shipped on the canal, or down to Providence, where, again, it could be shipped down to the West Indies, South America, or elsewhere in the United States. Now, Rick, as far as your organization, Rhode Island Historic Preservation Commission, how do you go about preserving this type of environment and making sure that we still have this information years in the future? Right. The, the Historical Preservation Commission is, has, a, has a dual mission. Uh, and the first of these is to basically to, to survey the state and find out where rare historical resources such as this are. And not surprisingly, Lime Rock was one of the first such resources that we surveyed after our commission was created uh, in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And in our survey, we designated a historic district here, the Lime Rock Village, that includes the area where we're standing now, and had it entered on the National Register of Historic Places, uh, which is the, the national listing of outstanding historical sites. By listing it on the National Register, we have provided it with a measure of protection from various public activities, uh, such as the, the State Highway, which runs right through the historic district. We uh, and the Department of Transportation work very closely to ensure that improvements made to the highway do not adversely affect the important historical qualities here. Now, in addition to a regulatory or protective uh, benefit from National Register listing. Uh, we're also able to provide a measure of uh, support for the people who have the, the special honor and the special responsibility of living in historic districts. And most recently, one of the benefits we were able to give was to uh, extend a loan from our revolving loan fund to the Lincoln Conservation Land Conservation Trust to acquire this property on which we're standing, which was in danger of being developed. And another responsibility, which I'm happy to be uh, furthering today, is to educate people, mm -hmm. uh, to make them aware of just how special this is and how uh, endangered it can be, such as to, to lose these kilns, which have been here from 200 to 100 years, uh, would be a terrible loss, not just to Lime Rock, but to the people of Rhode Island, and in a larger sense, to the people of the country. As we continue our tour of the village of Lime Rock and the, the limestone quarry area here, we're here with Ruth Tatro, 
who is the former president of the Blackstone Historical Society, a member of the Lincoln Land Trust, and we're actually here to talk to Ruth a little bit about how do you preserve, how do local people get involved with preserving their history? And Ruth, we're standing right in front of the Maori Tavern, aren't we? Mm -hmm. That has a lot of history to it, doesn't it? Yes, yes. What kind of history was involved here? Well, uh, it first started up as a tavern, and uh, it served the stagecoaches as, the, as they would go from Providence to uh, Woonsocket and Worcester. And uh, it also served the people who were working with the limestone uh, company. And uh, if they hadn't finished their business in one day, they would stay here overnight and have their lodgings and then go on. After um, the days of being a tavern, it was a uh, farm. Well, there's an awful lot of folklore. It would take me a long time to tell you about it. But that's just one of the stories about the Maori Tavern. There also is another little story where one of the Maori boys, um, upon hearing about the uh, dedication that they were having of the uh, Bunker Hill Monument in Boston, decided he would go up and see the ceremony. And uh, so he took his shoes, a brand new pair of shoes, and he put them over his shoulder and he started walking. He walked all the way to the memorial. And uh, when he got to the ceremony, he put the shoes on. And then when the ceremony was over, he took the shoes off and he walked all the way home. You see, they were very frugal back in those days and they had to save everything and take care of everything very carefully. Well, um, at one time, I organized tours for the children. I wanted them to be interested in history and especially the history of Lincoln. And uh, so we would load the children onto a bus and uh, at some of the old homes, the historic homes, we would get out and we'd go through the buildings and others I would just point out what they were and uh, tell the children the history behind them. And um, when the uh, children finished their tours, they would go back and they would write a thank you note to me. And they were so interesting. And you, you could tell that they really enjoyed all those tours. And um, we feel it was an accomplishment of the Blackstone Valley Historical Society. Then, uh, when I saw the reception that um, history was uh, getting in Lincoln, I thought of so many places that should be preserved. And I thought, the chic way to do things now is to form a land trust. So I did form a land trust, and now uh, we're trying to preserve other scenic areas, open space, historical sites, and like that uh, for future generations. There's an area on Wilbur Road where you can stop and uh, you can overlook the, the valley. And it is so beautiful as it is now. You look into this green, peaceful valley. And I can just visualize it covered with house lots, a great big development in another 10 or 15 years because Lincoln is, is being developed so rapidly. And I would like to save an area like that for future generations so that they could get out and, and see these restful areas because the pace of life is becoming so fast, you need uh, to get back to nature to find your roots. Well, we've given you all the clues now of why the village of Lime Rock is such a unique and rare site. But we've had with us today Nancy Britton, who's the community planner for the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor and who represents the National Park Service's role here in the Valley to talk about how do we actually preserve this unique and rare entity. So Nancy, how do we go about that very difficult project? Well, first of all, you need to make people aware of what's so important about where they live. And you talk to a lot of people today and you've seen a lot of the different things that make up a very unique kind of landscape in the Valley. So part of, is just, uh, part of it is just making people aware of what they've got. And then there are all sorts of steps that people can take individually or together that can help preserve historic resources or protect land uh, or just um, make the history available for people so that that 
interest continues to grow. And so all of that is part of a protection strategy. You know, you see the highway uh, Route 146 was built in the 40s, and that really separated the village in two. Um, still, somehow, this place seems to have a lot of staying power. It seems to uh, still have a lot of the resources that it once had. The, the lime quarry is still going, and it's still a viable industrial concern here. And so there are a lot of things that, have, that continue. But, um, but sometimes all of that is very fragile, and that's why we care about protecting it for the future. And one of the things that the Commission and the Park Service can help do is bring people together to help solve these kinds of issues. Um, sometimes the, the local land trust won't have all of the answers, or one organization won't have all the answers, or the town won't have all of the answers either. And we have different people on our commission who represent local government, um, who represent the different departments in the state governments of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And so all of these heads put together, we can sometimes come up with some different ideas that maybe not one person or one group of people can do on their own. That's fantastic. So we've talked about education, we've talked about involvement, we're talking about awareness, and the fact that there's so much here that just makes good sense that since it's been preserved for so long, that we have this obligation to continue to make sure these historical and cultural areas here continue to be preserved. And that's part of our role here in the Valley, isn't it, Nancy? That's right, that's right. In our, in our plan that was put together with a lot of people's involvement, um, we identified a lot of the important landscapes in the Valley, and Lime Rock was one of them. And so that's what we do. We're, you know, we try to strike where there's a little fire and energy in the community. And, and boy, the people of Lincoln really had that in the local land trust and the Nature Conservancy. Um, they had that energy. And so we said, this is a place that, you know, something's happening here. And, and there are more parts to this future. And, and it could turn out really wonderfully, or it could hurt some parts of the village. So we, we needed to get involved. Well, folks, we hope you've gained an appreciation of how important it is to preserve the valley. More importantly, we hope you've picked up a few ideas of how to do some of this preservation work yourself. Now, Dick, it looks like we lost Ranger Buchanan, huh? Oh, she's out in the valley somewhere giving a walking tour. I bet you're right. Talking about preservation, this spot where we're standing is pretty unique, isn't it? This really is, Chuck. This is the Waters Farm in Sutton, Massachusetts. And not only is it an old house, 1757, but it was owned by one family through all those years. And the remarkable thing is that members of the family all kept diaries. Over that 250 year period, what a beautiful way to make history. That's incredible. Just another good reason why it's important to preserve the valley. So I'm Ranger Chuck Arning. And I'm Dick Kleber. And for Ranger Suzanne Buchanan, who's somewhere out in the Blackstone Valley, we'll catch you along the Blackstone. Summer uniforms, you think, Dick? Not at least.